Hello. The title of my presentation today is uh, Animists Ever Since, the Santo Nino and Popular Piety. Um, I will explain what I mean by that. But before that, I, I want to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, the Folklore Studies Program, especially for placing me in the, in the panel among anthropologists who I greatly admire and greatly like, Paring Bert and, uh, and Xiao Chua. Um, I'm looking forward to having a very good conversation with you about this very important and timely topic. Um, next slide, please. I first want to um, situate my discussion in the context of, of the Santo Nino by drawing our recollection to a survey conducted by Father Benigno Beltran in, uh, in a work called the, uh, the Christology of the Inarticulate. And in that survey, which uh, I believe was conducted by, uh, with, uh, with about 10,000 respondents, one of the questions that he asked was, which image of Christ do you prefer? And here are the figures that, uh, that uh, resulted from that survey. The Santo Nino at 17% is not uh, identified as the most preferred image of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, the crucified Christ and Nazareno and the Sacred Heart um, have, uh, you know, very significant sort of uh, resonance for many uh, Filipino Catholics. But I would say that only among, among these uh, images, only the Santo Nino and the Santo Nino de Cebu in particular uh, can uh, be associated as a manifestation of uh, Filipino Roman Catholicism from its very beginnings in the archipelago. Um, and one could even say that uh, only the Santo Nino can, uh, can be a symbol, a manifestation of the Philippines itself, to the extent that the Philippines is uh, uh, very much um, uh, celebrates its, uh, its uh, Roman Catholic heritage. Uh, the image that you see here is the official logo of the the, the 500th uh, centennial, um, or the fifth centennial, sorry, of uh, of Roman Catholicism in the Philippines. Um, that image um, is uh, significant because it symbolizes not only the temporal period in which Santo Nino has been meaningful for Roman Catholics, but also the uh, the spatial context. Cebu is identified there in uh, by way of a map. Um, but also uh, by the fact that the Santo Nino is literally being handed to, uh, to as, as you can see from the image, is being handed to, uh, to the Filipino people um, upon the arrival of uh, Magellan in 1521. Um, but next slide, please. What I want to do, though, is four things. Uh, first of all, I want to expand that idea, uh, that idea of the Santo Nino being a manifestation of Filipino Roman Catholicism um, by suggesting that uh, that the heritage that the Santo Nino manifests is much wider than Roman Catholicism, that the heritage that the Santo Nino uh, indexes um, goes farther back than 500 years uh, to speak about our, uh, our indigenous traditions um, that could be uh, described as animism, but in many ways can also extend beyond that. Okay, so I have four things to, to discuss today and hopefully I could um, roughly time that for five minutes each. In the first part, I want to talk about the Santo Nino as a figure of providence. Um, here I want to talk about the Santo Nino as historical marker, a manifestation of the cultural and religious tendency of, uh, of, of uh, Filipino Roman Catholics to think about the legacy of, uh, of uh, Spanish Roman Catholicism. But also I want to reframe that uh, legacy by identifying agency as an important part of, uh, of what the Santo Nino manifests. And when I say agency, I just refer to the idea or the capacity to act independently. So in short, I want to talk about the Santo Nino as a, uh, a signifier of our cultural and religious tendency to ascribe agency to material objects. Okay, so that's the first part. The next part, I want to talk about uh, animism or idolatry. And I want now to bring that discussion towards uh, how um, the, uh, the popular devotion to the Santo Nino engages with uh, the institutional church, and particularly the doctrines uh, of the institutional church as it has emerged over the centuries. 
Um, and one of the, the ways in which we can think about that engagement is to, is to try to contextualize this idea of, uh, of agency, this idea of, uh, of animism with the notion of idolatry. And I don't seek to resolve this, uh, this uh, engagement. I don't seek to sort of engage in a theological discussion, but rather I just want to um, further highlight the idea of agency and animism as it is understood in the engagement between institutional Catholicism and uh, popular religion. So that leads on to our third uh, discussion, which uh, I've entitled Espiritu Hanun. Now, Espiritu Hanun is, uh, is actually one third of an ensemble of, uh, of Cebuano personality traits uh, that has been conceptualized by Cebuano psychologists, um, all of which constitute what's known as Subuano Taras, or a glimpse of Cebuano personality. And what it is, uh, Espiritu Hanun, is a psychocultural description of uh, ritual acts that, uh, that in many ways defines uh, the popular devotion to the Santo Nino. So in the third part of this discussion, I just want to isolate three ritual, uh, ritual acts um, that are associated with Santo Nino devotion. And then again, touching on this idea of agency and touching on this idea of animism. So finally, I want to bring that discussion and round it off by talking about this um, notion of, of animism but not in a sense of how it's conventionally defined. I think when we think about animism, um, many of us might, uh, might fathom some rather pejorative, uh, pejorative ideas that animism is somehow uh, a kind of characteristic of, uh, of primitive religion uh, or even unsophisticated religious agency. But what I want to do in this third part is to kind of um, connect the discussion of the Santo Nino with more recent uh, discourses in anthropology or the anthropology of religion in particular, in which people are talking about a new way of thinking about animism, or more specifically, a new way of reinterpreting and, and reinscribing um, the ideas of, uh, of animism. So what I propose is that the Santo Nino is a tangible manifestation of a parallel uh, heritage that people in the country have been cultivating for five centuries or even more, that this is a propensity to think of material objects as alive, um, that material objects possess agency, that material objects are framed in relational and embodied encounters, which performance is also a very important facet. So these are the four things that I'd like to talk about. Um, let me begin by asking for the next slide, please. I begin by uh, showing you a very popular image, and I think that this is rather familiar to many of, of us uh, who, uh, who think about uh, what occurred in 1521 in Cebu in particular. Um, this image uh, by uh, Botong Francisco displayed at the National Art Gallery uh, is meaningfully juxtaposed against uh, the testimony or the, the, the account of uh, Antonio Pigafetta, who, who said uh, that she was uh, his, the queen of Cebu, uh, the Queen of Cebu was shown an image of Our Lady, a very beautiful wooden child Jesus, and a cross. Thereupon, she was overcome with contrition and asked for baptism amid her tears. Um, she asked us to give her the little child Jesus to keep in place of her idol idols, and then she went away. So I think this is one of the things, one of the events, uh, when we think about 500 years of Roman Catholicism in the Philippines, that resonates very popularly among many Filipino Catholics. But I want to draw your attention to... Um, a slightly different um, translation of the Picapetta text. The next slide, please. In the next slide, we have the same um, uh, account by Picapetta, uh, translated uh, from the French, um, from the uh, Vienneke Rare Book uh, Manuscript Library at Yale. And we have the same passage, uh, but there is a different kind of resonance. Okay, So it's the same passage. Meanwhile, we showed the Queen of Cebu, a lady carved in wood, holding her child and a cross. Then she begged us to give her that wooden image to put in place of her idols. Now, what is the slight and very significant difference between these two accounts? Um, in my opinion, I think that in the first account, we get a, a stronger sense of the autonomy of the Santo Nino image. In the second account, we um, imagine this notion of uh, the, the child, the infant child connected to its mother. And um, so my question is, why is it that the, uh, the image 
uh, of an autonomous Santo Nino is what resonated very much with uh, with um, uh, Roman Catholics in the Philippines in subsequent centuries. Well, um, we can talk about that. There are many ways to, uh, to sort of discuss that. But I think uh, one answer can be found if we move forward in the historical record to consider the second arrival, uh, if you like, of, uh, of the Spanish in the archipelago in Cebu. Next slide, please. We are moving forward um, uh, after that, please, one more. Moving forward to 19, uh, 1565, when, as, uh, as we are familiar, um, Miguel Lopez de Legaspi uh, made uh, his arrival in, uh, in Cebu. Um, and another very, very significant event transpired upon that uh, arrival, and that is the rediscovery of the Santo Nino. And here is the account of that rediscovery. Juan de Camus of Bermejo, mariner and a flagship uh, of the flagship, found in one of the houses among the poor, simpler and humble uh, and small, and with little furnishings, an image of the child Jesus in a pine box with a red velvet hat in the Flemish style, ruffled shirt, and so on and so forth. So what you have here is a description of the Santo Nino as we know today. Uh, the second image, the first image I showed earlier was just the, uh, the image that's uh, present in the, uh, the Basilica, the Santo Nino. So what we have here is Juan Camus um, discovering in almost a very mystical context, the Santo Nino in a pine box. Um, another very po popular image, next slide, please, is uh, that by uh, the Cebuano painter Manuel Pañares. Um, and what we have here is a, a kind of similar uh, drama in the discovery of the Santo Nino, but in a more poignant way because the Santo Nino is discovered uh, or rediscovered, literally displacing uh, indigenous idols, as you see here in the photograph, uh, in the painting. Um, so what we have, I suppose, in 1565, is a, uh, a, an emphasis that the Santo Nino is indeed an autonomous figure, um, is indeed a figure that has its own divine agency in the sense that it itself was um, uh, the omen, the token, uh, the tangible object that made, uh, that justified Spanish, uh, the continuance of Spanish missionary endeavors uh, and colonial endeavors in the Philippines. Um, I suppose the other thing that we don't really think about in the context of, uh, of the second discovery is the fact that it was very much an illegal act. Next step, slide, please. Um, the Gaspi and his men were explicitly, explicitly ordered not to take uh, any objects from the field in a settlement by force or against their will. After all, what they were doing in, in upon the discovery of uh, the Santo Nino was um, ransacking the, uh, the inhabitants' houses. But the other thing that I suppose uh, needs to be contextualized or needs to be included in the context is the fact that Legaspi himself um, thought about this rediscovery of the Santo Nino in very, very significant terms. In the next slide, we have the, uh, the testimony of Legaspi himself, who said that upon the discovery of the image, war could justly be waged, having admitted the evangelical doctrine they, they apostatized and having gone back to their idolatries and for the betrayal and great malevolence they exercised with Magallanes. Okay, So I think the, these two um, aspects of the rediscovery of the Nino should also be kind of uh, included in, uh, in this kind of discussion. Now I want now to move, uh, move on to, to thinking about the Santo Nino as an object of agency. What I have here is, uh, is the anthropologist Astrid Salaboza's uh, classification of the various miracles that were associated with the Santo Nino. And what I, what I want to do, though, is I want to categorize it in a slightly different way. The Santo Nino's miracles, and there are many, as many of uh, you no doubt realize, is that uh, these, these miracles can be kind of categorized as either the Santo Nino being a kind of hero, a hero provider of, uh, of uh, material and spiritual nourishment for, uh, for his devotees. Um, you have other miracles that talk about the Santo Nino's capacity to move, uh, to move from one place to the other. Oftentimes, its uh, its moving is its movement is uh, is a, uh, reiterates a particular kind of lineage to uh, a connection to Cebu. And the third category of uh, miracles is the idea of uh, ethno nationalist sympathizer, in which the Santo Nino often reiterates its connection to Cebu. Um, often in, in opposition to Manila. 
Okay, so a kind of Edmund Laschet sympathizer. But what I want to, uh, to emphasize here again is the idea that the miracles that is ascribed to the Santo Nino, again, highlights his capacity for independent action or for agency. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, the next slide, um, I think, frames uh, a very important um, um, a very important way to understand the relationship between uh, between institutional religion and popular piety. And that is the idea that the, the image of the Santo Nino, like many other images in Roman Catholicism, is meant to be a reminder uh, of one's relationship to God. Okay? And here uh, is a passage from the Catechism for Filipino Catholics, um, which reminds uh, Filipino the faithful that we must recognize the ever-present temptation from merely reminding us of God the material image tends to gradually become a god or an idol. Next slide, please. Um, here, uh, from the very recent uh, statements of uh, Archbishop Palma, uh, just this January, the image of the Santo Nino is a reminder that in our society there are many who may be called little, okay? They may be called little children or people with little dignity, you might say, persons in the periphery, slum dwellers, and the poor and the sick, those who are marginalized. Um, but again, the Archbishop Palma is emphasizing that um, material objects do not have powers on their own, do not have agency on in and of itself, but rather have a function towards connecting one to uh, to to God in this uh, in this way. The next image, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, just again from the uh, Catechism for Filipino Catholics. The proper use of such image is by avoiding any and all appearances of making the images into idols or treating them as endowed with some magical powers. So I think um, this idea of agency as, uh, as miraculous agency, um, I think constitutes a particular kind of drama that we find with, uh, with Roman Catholicism. What I want to do now for the last uh, five minutes is I want to talk about three um, rituals that are conducted uh, in in Cebu and, and other places in the Philippines. Next slide, please. The first one uh, is the visitation and tacticity. Uh, as uh, many of you are aware, people will visit the Santo Nino and wipe their handkerchiefs on the Santo Nino, on the glass that encases the Santo Nino. And that is then also, that uh, handkerchief is then um, um, understood to have its power, right? To transport its power in a kind of tactile mode of, uh, of agency. Um, the next kind of ritual, uh, category of rituals is replication or personalization. Um, the Santo Nino has, uh, there are many replicas available of the Santo Nino, readily available in the environment of the Basilica. But then these replicas are then become, then, then become sort of personal emblems for the devotees. And we have here just a few examples uh, for the next slide, please. Not sure I, why I chose PNP ones in particular, but there are many, many different uh, variations of this uh, of this idea of personalization. Here you have one from San Beda. Siguro pinili ko yan because uh, alumni ako na San Beda. But anyway, here is something that uh, demonstrates the personalization that people have for the Santo Nino image. But what I, want, what I want to sort of highlight with that is a passage, next slide please, uh, in which a devotee is talking about how they engage with the Santo Nino image. Okay, I'll, I'll invite you to read the ones in red. I quarreled with the Santo Nino in our altar every night. Eventually, I became so afraid. He seems to be speaking back to me. And my, my, propose, my proposition is that this is a very common way of dealing with the Santo Nino, engaging with the Santo Nino, as though he had the capacity to act on his own. Okay, This idea of agency, again, is reiterated. So the last one is uh, uh, kinesthetic embodiment. Next slide, please. So I, I draw your attention once again to the Sinulog, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Tiatko had talked about this earlier in, this, in his presentation. The idea of embodiment and movement is very much a testament to uh, how the Santo Nino devotees engage with the, the material icon itself. Okay? There are, of course, two kinds of, uh, of Sinulog. One is uh, based on the Tindera's um, uh, supplication. And the last one is, uh, or the other one is, uh, next slide, please, the very famous Sinulog festival. Both of these uh, um, facets of the Sinulog involve movement, involve the body, right, in a very, very significant way. 
So let me um, let me now bring this uh, discussion to a close by by talking about animism and how it's understood. Um, what I've been talking about in the past few minutes is the idea that the Santo Nino has agency. The Santo Nino has an autonomous uh, volition of its own, and that is a very significant part of Santo Nino devotion. And this idea, this concept of uh, of agency, communicates very very effectively with um, ideas that are known in anthropology as the new animism, okay? which talk about relational epistemologies or ontologies, or a way of living meaningfully in a community of uh, persons by cultivating deep relationships with others who are not necessarily human. Okay? Let me um, maybe summarize um, what the, uh, the new animism sort of conveys. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? There are three points I think that's important to, uh, to think about with the new animism. The first is, Next, first point, please, next slide. The first is that the new animism involves an expansive ontological personhood, the idea that not all persons are human. So to think about the Santo Nino as a person capable of communication, capable of his own act okay, of miraculous agency, that is a feature of this uh, new configuration of animism. Next, next slide, please. The idea that objects are engaged with as communicative subjects who do have the capacity to respond. They are not inert, inert objects. They are not merely reminders. They are rather interlocutors, right, in the, in the faith uh, relationship. And lastly, uh, next slide, a relational ontology or, or objects come to life in the process of relating to it, in the process of actually intersubjectively communicating with it through embodiment and performance. Um, next slide, please. I think uh, this particular passage will highlight that an object person is only alive when interacting with a human person. The act of relating is what does the animating. So uh, to wrap up, uh, uh, what I wanted to do is just to propose a kind of um, a convergence of conversations. On the one hand, we have the Santo Nino devotion understood as a kind of legacy of Roman Catholicism. And on the other hand, you have uh, a new understanding or a reinvigorated understanding of animism which I think enriches our discussion of, uh, of popular piety. I wanna make it clear that I'm not uh, calling for a revival of pre-colonial uh, religion. I'm not making any nativist claims about pre-colonial religion, or I'm not even, I'm not really saying either that, uh, that somehow conversion to Roman Catholicism has been incomplete or in, in, uh, invalid. But what I'm saying though, is that there is space within the frame of, uh, of Roman Catholicism to think about animism um, in uh, as as a kind of facet of Filipino religiosity. So, maraming salamat po, and I will end there.